The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome, everybody. Coffee with Cluffy, Bob Hot Rod Roar. I'm going to be uh, helping Jim today. So Jim's going to be our presenter. And I'm telling you, I haven't met Jim in person yet, but he is a wealth of information on this topic. Uh, you know, we keep trying to do a one-hour practice that turns into a two-and-a-half hour, and I'm still asking him questions. So there he is. There's our guy. There's Jim, uh, my best friend who I haven't met yet. So um, I think you're going to learn a lot. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim, and let's jump into it. Thanks for that introduction, Bob. Yeah. Uh, so this is Jim Kozmatka. I'm a plumber by trade. I have uh, over 30 years now of experience in the field. And for about the last 10, I've been uh, learning and uh, have delved, delved into speak, uh, inspecting and teaching now about cross-connection backflow protection uh, for state of Wisconsin. So I work for a water purveyor in the area with uh, a few hundred thousand customers. And what I do is go door to door and do cross connection surveys. And we share a lot of education, meet with plumbers, manufacturers. Uh, I actually, I inspected Kalefi and we've established a relationship where we're working together. They're helping train us and, and uh, we're sharing our information with them. So uh, today we're gonna try to go through a number of slides that will illustrate some good topics. If you can advance to the next one, please, Bob. Yep. So what we're going to try to do is uh, talk about common terms and references. Uh, everything shown here, why are the backflow preventers used? We'll have examples of uh, fluids and hazards to guard against. We'll break that down into different levels and categories. Talk a little bit about back siphonage, back pressure. Uh, hoping that, uh, I would assume that all our guests and everybody tuning in today, uh, at least a few of these are resonating uh, with you of interest and you're familiar with what this is all about. And uh, ASSC standards, okay, that's, that's very important because what we all have to work together to accept is that somebody has tested and listed these devices and assemblies and methods and uh, so those are the folks who we can refer to. It's not the manufacturer telling us that, that this is okay or this has this built in. It's not the inspector saying this is what I want to sit, what I want to see, or or even the plumber. We're we're all covering ourselves by an independent, you know, some independent third parties that extends to uh, underwriters laboratories too, and uh, other other safety uh, USC, okay, University of Southern California. Uh, Inspector considerations, I know I'll uh, delve into that, and common mistakes. All right, sounds good. We'll move forward on that. So many things with the plumbing code, and then with backflow protection, it's driven by definition, so we all can kind of get on the same page. So cross connections, uh, we'll, we'll show, in, show in later slides, actual cross connections, potential cross connections, type of inspection, programs, okay, containment and isolation, that also applies to what you're going to do with a hazard concern. Are you going to isolate that from everything in the system, or containment would lend itself towards, are you going to contain this building from the entire uh, community or mun municipality system? Then degree of hazard, is it polluted or is it contaminated? So. We might break that one down. Is it going to give you a little stomach ache and make make you a little bit ill or have an objectionable odor or, or uh, appearance or color? Okay, taste. Um, contaminated, now that's something that could, could really put you in the hospital or could be fatal. So that's where we got to delve into very serious backflow protection. Shown on the very next line, backflow protection. Devices typically associated with low hazard. Assemblies are associated with high hazard or contaminant. And then methods, that would be uh, air gap. Your best level of protection, atmospheric or air separation between our safe potable water and a suspect source it might touch or a process, but not always uh, practical. You, can, you cannot always have an air gap because you might need your system pressurized or you might need the properties that are in that water, uh, the chlorine, uh, it, it has to stay in the state it's being delivered. So some of the uh, text will 
be referring to would be from uh, ASSE's guide to devices and assemblies. And what they try to illustrate is your application and selection there. And that I'll want to visit later. And then uniform plumbing code. What I'd like to say about that is certain, there are a few states that have their own code. Uh, and there is international plumbing code. Wisconsin, for example, has their, their own state code. Now, I've, I've talked to some folks around the country who have adopted the uniform plumbing code. They are still able to have their uh, input and have like here we would call it Wisconsinisms. So there would be added uh, text sometimes that in this area, the Wisconsin code would supersede the uniform plumbing code, maybe take it to a little higher level of extent. And so very important that for the manufacturers, more so the installers, the plumbers, the contractors, you know what the authority having jurisdiction is going to expect, okay? And you can try to find out why, but Easier said than done. Uh, communication is the key and the collaboration of uh, the manufacturers, again, the inspectors, the plumbers working together, that everybody ultimately puts in the approved device, the economical device, and, the, and you know, the bottom line, the correct safety assembly device, or et cetera. So shown on this slide, this is a typical uh, community distribution system or from a water purveyor. So they have a variety of customers and some of these buildings that might be looked at as a higher level of a concern than others. Now the bottom right is a residential and what they might do on some of these lines, these laterals going to each unit is, is put a backflow preventer to contain that building, contain buildings uh, from each other, okay? They're isolating the building, but containing in that building that could, it can only commingle there. Now what's also very important, which uh, we did get some pre-submitted questions, when do you see uh, a backflow preventer within a building and multiple backflow preventers? Now in the residence, you see the hose there's a potential cross connection that that hose could be put into a swimming pool or connected to some pesticides. On that hose faucet, you, you will see a backflow preventer integrated there. And when you look inside the building, you, you see a tub filling, it, it appears at the top. You see the faucet is above the tub, so there's your air gap separation. So in a residence, they're, they're more of a low level of concern of what's going on than in, in these commercial buildings. On the left, you see uh, industrial, okay? So here's some interesting things you're gonna have. You're gonna have the boiler. Now that boiler builds pressure. So that pressure could overcome the, the system pressure. And uh, it's important to know how much pressure that boiler can build. A lot of municipalities may operate as low as 35 PSI, maybe up to 80 PSI before they start to need booster pumps or pressure reducing valves. If that boiler can overcome system pressure, you're going to need uh, varying degrees of backflow preventers. What an ASSC standard is if it builds over 30 pounds, and in this case it may, just the consideration of the elevation, a little taller building, we typically concern ourselves and look at them closely when they're over three stories. If you get over 30 pounds, you need a high hazard backflow preventer on the line that isolates that boiler. That'd be Kalefi 574, the ASSC 1013. And, and you can see now on the top, you might have that air conditioning or chiller. You may have some open tanks up there. Now there, you're either gonna have to make sure you got air gap separation or again, ASSC 1013, refer to, refer to them as RPs, okay, to contain that high hazard. If it's an open vat, there can be all kinds of, you know, contaminate, contaminants in there, even vermin or birds or all kinds of undesirable things that nobody wants to have associated with their drinking water. So just, just illustrated here well is different level of the customers being served and what they're using water for. And then how we got to concern ourselves if our pressure is overcome or our pressure reduces to a level or even we lose pressure or have a break. We'll move forward. 
quickly in this slide, it's very important what we're shown, uh, the direction of flow. Some of these are flowing left to right, some of them are flowing right to left, but it's identified on one side of the valve that the water is safe, and on the other side of the valve, that water uh, may likely be non-potable or protected. It's going to a process where you don't want to use it for anything other than that process or piece of equipment that is protected by the backflow preventers. So these here are shown uh, multi, uh, many different manufacturers of, of ASSC 1013s, and and they're going to different different processes that you don't want to commingle again. So the the labeling and tagging is very important to tell everybody the the mechanics and plumbers and facility staff that you need to know what what's going on with this water line before you can assume to take it to uh, any other equipment, especially whether it would be for drinking or coffee, et cetera. Now, Jim, I think you said that the green colors, usually even if the, like, the printing was gone off of one of these, green indicates what go, or green is always the kind of international safe side. Right, and, and sometimes when, when it's just piping on a ceiling now, about every 25 feet, you may just have a, a six inch green band. Uh -huh. And that's going to indicate uh, that you see there a small label. So labeling and tagging is addressed differently by different uh, inspectors and authorities have in the jurisdiction. But typically 20 to 25 feet, you're going to want to have it color coded. And if it goes through a wall, you're going to want to identify it again because mm -hmm. you want to indicate what that pipe is. It's, it's a new beginning when it goes into another room. So again, uh, the labeling and tagging is very important because the water quality, the water Water safety changes. Yep. Okay. So here, in, on the next slide, we're showing uh, back. Okay, different types of backflow. So water is going to flow back if it's not pressured or pumped into the building. If we lose our pressure, your water will just come back because of gravity. And uh, in the northern climate, you're going to find our water mains typically are down about eight feet. And so if we don't have pressure or if our pipe ruptures is, isn't open, we have some type of failure, your water's going to flow out of your building and go into the mains and commingle. And when we repressurize it, we may be pumping some contaminated or polluted water to other customers. So there's the perfect example of the backflow preventer uh, there. And as it starts to flow back, it can actually create a siphon. And then also illustrated, we'll go to the next slide and show that one real quickly. As we talked, equipment can build pressure. So that pressure can pump back against city water pressure. So if our pressure gets quite low, it's, it's gonna overcome it and pump its contaminants or pollutants, used water, if you will, back into the potable water. So that's again where the backflow preventer will guard against. And I would say on that one for us, uh, Jim, probably boilers is what we would be concerned about because they, as they heat up, the thermal expansion can overcome the pressure that's out here, and that's the uh, that's the hazard we're worried about, right? Right, and then the degree of hazard is important because if there's any chemicals in that uh, boiler piping for some reason, rust inhibitors or things like that, that's when you start to escalate to a high hazard concern. You need a high hazard backflow preventer that also aligns itself with testable assemblies. And then a, a concern initially with boilers or fire protection systems, once it gets into heating system piping or fire protection piping, they're not using potable water piping anymore. So you need to protect against just uh, what type of piping is used. That, that creates a hazard in itself, a low level hazard just by piping material. So you do need a backflow preventer. That's gonna be along the lines on a boiler of ASSE 1012. That's the Kalefi 1070, uh, 573. Yep, and so you're talking like steel pipe or something like that on a sprinkler system that's not deadly, but you certainly don't want that rusty water flowing back. Correct, or cast yeah. iron. So we have an ex extensive chart here for se selecting uh, backflow preventers, and that can be viewed on this presentation at any time. So we, we wouldn't go through that whole list, but further on what we did was broke down to some of the more common backflow preventers that we've seen. And we have a, some nice uh, simpler charts if you can advance to that. 
Well, Bob, could you take this one? Uh, yes, I'll uh, talk about this. I think what we tried to do here is show probably some of the most common things that plumbers that are tuned in today or even homeowners are going to see on their building. So this one here, you know, not all jurisdictions are requiring this, but we've got some slides, obviously, from this fellow back, uh, back east that uh, – I don't know, Instagram or something, we pulled these off. I just like to, and he was using the cluffy mixing valve, but we noticed there that he had a, a vacuum breaker in there, and his code requires that, so this uh, tank couldn't collapse if there was a back siphon, and just you know, the water tried to go backwards there. So, again, that was an example of what Jim spoke about, where the HJ in that area is saying, no, I want to see these on there. It is kind of vague in the code, and a lot of codes maybe are purposely written vague that, you know, when do I need this and when don't I need it? I've seen some that say, well, this is upstairs where there's, you know, the potential for it to drain down to a lower level, then we want it, but if it's on a main level, we don't. So, again, talk to your AHJ or learn your code, and it could change from city to city as you go. This one here, I'm sure everybody's seen this. This is an example where if this hose is in a mud puddle or something like that, we certainly don't want that going back in. This is going to typically be an assembly that's built into this uh, uh, hot and cold uh, outside the uh, Cross proof, obviously, uh, hose faucet. Now, there's also ones like these little, this is probably your least expensive uh, device that you'll find out there, but Jim will indicate probably one of the best ones. This is one that you can just screw on to like a mop sink here. And as I remember, when you screw these on, you're supposed to tighten this little pinch bolt and take a wrench and break it off so somebody can't unscrew that. It actually bites into the brass and prevents that from being removed. But this down here, I want Jim to talk about this here because I, I, this is something I learned. I didn't realize about this non continuous, uh, the time time period for these type of devices. Tell me a little bit more about that, Jim. Well, basically, that, that device is, uh, you know, economically produced, and it's, it has a spring in there, which is designed to just open and close and flow through. Uh, I, basically, if you leave that charged for a number of days, you're going to void your manufacturer warranty for a reason because they know it's not going to perform. So it's interesting, you'll see in some of the charts we have or the ASSE charts that that's a high hazard backflow preventer. But right away that leads to that we need to understand you, you need to use the correct backflow preventer for each application. Now, I've seen this in piping systems. People want to put this in a piping system and use a hose and then continually uh, pressurize or supply a piece of equipment, and they, they don't really know why they can't do that. But that's not designed for inline duty or to be continuously open. You also can't uh, put a positive shutoff downstream of that, like a, a ball valve or something that's going to turn that thing off and leave it loaded through with pressure. So continuous pressure is is one of the common things that need to be understand, understood, discussed, and agreed upon between everyone involved in, in a process or uh, a water supply issue. Also orientation, you can't have those upside down. So there, there's different things you have to understand what can create back pressure, what, what continuous duty is, and uh, you know, where you can have elevated piping or even elevated hoses out of it. We have on our charts vacuum breakers. And then again, the, the ASSE 1013s, those are the ones that you can have elevated piping coming out of. You can have continuous pressure. It's going to be open all the time, whether it's flowing or not. And let's move forward. It'll show those slides, some of that a little more. So here's where we break down some of the charts. We have the 1012, and you, let's go to the 1012. That's one we see quite a bit, uh, Kalefi 573. That's on a lot of boilers. No evidence of chemicals in those boilers being added. Uh, it falls into that low hazard column. That, that, uh, that valve is approved for back pressure, back siphonage, continuous pressure. But again, that's a low hazard backflow preventer. Anytime there's evidence of chemicals being added, and even if someone's telling you they're using uh, a propylene glyco or some food grade chemical, typically jurisdictions are gonna say, if you can add chemicals, we're not gonna assume for years down the road you're always gonna bear the expense and use these good chemicals. You may. You may use, or someone at a, us uneducated may put the wrong chemical in there. So any evidence of chemical is going to escalate to a high hazard. And then again, the ASSE 1012, what I, what I want to say is on a boiler or pressure building equipment, it, it, it extends also to uh, 
espresso machines, if that machine can build over 15 PSI for a steam boiler or steam generator or 30 PSI for a water boiler, that escalates to a high hazard just based on the pressure built by that equipment. And they, there's enough of a concern again that you need a, a annually tested assembly. ASSE 1013, that's referred to as an RP or Kalefi 574. That is tested typically annually, tested when it's installed, tested when it's repaired. So the hazard dictates that we got to have some uh, record that this thing is performing, doing its job or capable of doing its job. So these charts that we have broken down here simply and quickly for you, uh, the ASSC 1015 typically in Wisconsin, that's legal on fire protection. That's the only application you're going to see that. Uh, ASSC 1048 is basically fire protection again with a bypass to detect any leakage or theft of water. So we can move on. These slides will be available to view at any time and we can answer questions on it. Let's go to the next slide because it shows the 1024 in uh, in use, okay? So now this, we, we don't use these in Wisconsin as shown on the slide. Now, when we do see these, they're part of a piece of equipment that's already listed, tested and approved by either ASSE or state or local code. We do not see these externally, but here it's been used to contain uh, a building, okay? And uh, did you want to back up, Bob, and speak yeah, about just, that a second? Because this is just basically a double check. There's no vent. There's no. I mean, this is uh, this isn't obviously a high hazard. But I see these a lot. There's some jurisdictions that allow this on board. As I know, back in New York, the mid part of New York State, this is still an acceptable uh, device for for residential boilers. But um, again, you got to look at the consider what's in that boiler. So. Right, and uh, I don't want to hammer the point. Uh, too far, but the authority I have in jurisdiction, uh, it's important to work with them because, uh, you know, don't look at them as trying to puff their chest. They're just based on their experiences and uh, their knowledge and uh, product approval. They're going to interpret things a little differently, and they'll they'll have the uh, the ordinance or you know the state code to back them out up for different reasons. So again, when we when we see these, typically it's part uh, of a system that might be a dog wash system or uh, different water purification systems, but but the assembly, the whole product is listed and tested and approved by that, that independent agency, and that's important. So that's where we need to come together uh, and, and put our heads together, the plumbers, the inspectors, the manufacturers, and we all say, yeah, we all understand, but also this third party independent, they're the ones who are putting their name on it and telling everybody it's gonna work and it's approved. And then the inspector can come out and say, Yes, that's that's what I'm looking for, and I can show you, uh, you know, where the text is of of why we enforce this, for lack of a better word. There. And uh, Bob, can you speak about this one a little bit? Yeah, as well? I mean, this this is our our big seller by far. This is good, you know, we sell it individually, like you see it there. It can come with an assembly with a boiler fill valve on it. Uh, one of our two different uh, styles of fill valve so uh, a dual check but the difference between the previous one and this one is the vent port right here so as fluid comes in here pressure comes in a little strainer to pry and uh, protect these little check valves that are in here um, leave it in there I mean it, it's in there for a purpose I know a lot of people say you know I've got rusty water it's going to plug up right away and they leave it out but it does protect these little check valves so what happens with this one I just to touch briefly is the flow comes through pops open these two check valves and goes in the first thing that happens when the flow comes in is this little I'll call it a spool slides and it closes off right there that's actually an o-ring a section of an o-ring that you see cut away and this closes off this port so the water goes straight through otherwise if that didn't happen obviously the water would come in here and go right out through the port and then the water continues on into the uh, system I, I don't know if you can notice but there's different spring tensions on all these springs uh, the pop strength on when this happens so a few pounds of pressure is enough to seal this that it can go through the device into it. So the intention here is if we have a, a condition where we drop pressure here and this backs off its first spring, 
any water that could come back from the boiler is going to go down the vent. Now, the main thing about this is they do spit from time to time, or they'll drip, or they'll spray, or they'll just hammer every now and then. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's this device doing its job. If it sees a condition where this is backing off, it's supposed to open up the seal here, and you might get a little spit or a spray occasionally from time to time. Now, I know there's some installers, they'll put a soft seated check valve upstream of this right here so that if there is a water hammer or something in this system, it doesn't shock this little opening here and, and it can kind of eliminate or uh, at least reduce the potential of this thing to spit and spray. So with that in mind, if you're going to put this somewhere where that spit or that spray could cause harm, you want to put a pipe on this. And I know Jim's going to show some examples of that here in a minute that it's not going to spray into your boiler on top of some uh, equipment. So just know that the spit and the spray is an indication of the device doing its job. And um, it's a fairly simple, you know, you could disassemble it at this nut right here and get in there and clean that out if you had to. It does come apart. Rarely do people take the time to troubleshoot them and uh, put them back to use. They just replace it. But um, that's kind of my story, and I'm sticking to it, Jim, unless you have something to add. <laughs> no, and uh, pointing out uh, just the only thing, the nut and the unions, that's a nice feature on some of Kalefi's equipment, the, the 574s, too. The unions... Uh, come standard they're there so you can take these things apart and even you can loosen the unions and slide a new assembly or device right in there so yep. so that is very nice uh one thing that i've noticed especially on the 574s but again up here look at your column and what it protects it's not a high hazard device if this boiler has ethylene glycol in it that's not the right device for the application Right, and and as I said, in Wisconsin, any evidence of chemicals, it automatically automatically escalates to a high hazard concern. So we ha we show a 1012 here, uh, on some heating lines. Okay, uh, they they're controlling the flow down to the floor. Just wanted to talk about that AHJ again. In Wisconsin, we say if you put a pipe in there, you have to have that air gap adapter. So it's kind of funny. Are we, are we saying, you know, that the floor is going to be full of something, you know, or there's a sewage backup, and, you know, there's a water main break at the same time. Sure, all these things, uh, you know, that's a remote scenario, but that's what we have to protect against, the absolute uh, worst case scenario. And, and it's foolproof then. And, and that's what we're striving for. So that's what, you know, it, it's nice that with, with the installers, the plumbers, again, the inspectors, we're all working together to understand and justify and then and cover the liability and protect the public's health. That's our goal. Uh, custodians of the of the safe water, if you will. Let's go I'll to talk the next about, one and see what else we see. Go ahead. Talk sorry. about this, the testable backflow, the rating required. When it well, again, uh, we... It, Typically, you, you don't want to call pressure. Uh, I don't think you can say pressure is a hazard. However, uh, again, ASSE's uh, listing of the 1012. Okay, I actually uh, sat in on that, viewed that board in a, in a round table discussion and saw what they were talking about. And on their approval, 30 pounds wa uh, water or less, that's what that assembly has been tested and listed that it's going to, it's approved that it's going to perform. If you have over 30 pounds, and typically when I see a boiler and it's for a four story building, you see in the bottom right corner of, of this slide, they show the pressure blow off there. Okay. If we see that that pressure blow off is 50, typically we either see that's 30 or it's 50. If I see that's 50, then I reach out to the, to the maintenance staff, to the, to the staff at that building, and I say, your backflow preventer does not align with your uh, the pressure your boiler can build. So we either say, either if you can change that pressure relief uh, or you know valve on that boiler, and your boiler professional does that and and uh, authorizes that, then you're fine. If you cannot do that, now in our jurisdiction, we will say you're you're not doing a repair anymore. Now you're working on the drinking water. You're working on the potable water. Now that's plumber's work under permit and you need a high hazard backflow preventer. So it gives you a little insight to how we dissect things. Okay. And 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 we do try to be favorable. We'll say, can you change that blow off? Can your boiler accept that? Or you're gonna alter the potable water and put on the testable assembly. In this slide here, we show controlling the drain. Uh, they're using PECs. Okay, again, 
different jurisdictions are going to say if you need that air gap fitting. But important here, you're, this may drip for different reasons. It, uh, the checks, if you will, could be fouled with debris, Teflon tape, rust, uh, many different things. Or there could be a backflow situation. So if, you're, if your valve is going to vent or relieve, dump out the bottom, you don't want that going on electrical controls, any equipment, maybe even damaging a floor. So you have to be, again, worst case scenario. You've got to try to cover all, you know, we can't protect against everything, but the stuff that identifies itself, we got to do what we can. So just a, a number of these slides now are going to show different, some different installations of what we see. So we should be able to go through them fairly quickly. But again, uh, I think this is the Kalepi 573 here just shown there uh, basically all we're showing here is the vent again controlling the vent Bob do you want to speak about any uh, more of what some of those processes would be uh, no I think you're doing a good job here this is probably one of our combination assemblies here that comes with the uh, with the backflow and the, the boiler uh, fill valve okay. with the gauge and stuff on it some other nice Kalefi components thanks to the oil thrusters yeah, and, and then that. It's uh, what day in and day out. So what I do, going door to door, on the right side here, is the flow, okay? And so that's the potable water. So that's that's what I do day in and day out is find out where the buck stops. And it's very interesting and you know enlightening to understand what a lot of processes are. But we we see many dozens or hundreds of processes. Whether it, whether it be chrome plating or one of them that I saw. They had an RP and it went in up to heat a helicopter pad on a roof for something and there was antifreeze in there. And uh, it, we didn't know where that pipe went. So at the end of the day, we had to find out wh where does it go once it goes through the wall. So then once we researched it, it we found out it went into a system that, that thawed, uh, you know, some some piping on the roof and it took care of snow melt, et cetera, et cetera. But we had to know, did it ultimately go into uh, a heating system? We had to know where it ultimately went. Here again, uh, just a field installation of the 1012 uh, and making some adjustment there on pressure regulators. Okay. But no vent, no vent tube on this one. Nope. So apparently they're determined uh, likely that it's not going to cause a hazard if that drips. Maybe just yep. on a concrete floor, make its way to a floor drain. So talking a little bit more about the 1013 and what I want to say, in it, excuse me, illustrated in that large chart that we had from ASSE, uh, they're going to say what the approvals are for, low hazard and, you know, the back siphonage, back pressure. One thing I like to illustrate when I'm talking with plumbers and trades folks out there or facility staff, back pressure, what we say is uh, elevated piping equals back pressure. So the 1013 is the only one you can install and then take piping out of it and go somewhere else, go up. Uh, many of the assemblies and devices you see, vacuum breakers, whether they there's testable vacuum breakers, there's atmospheric vacuum breakers, spring-loaded vacuum breakers, you cannot have elevated piping. And, and then there's a concern that comes into play also. Uh, five feet, and, and this varies by jurisdiction, but five to seven feet is the maximum height you can put a lot of uh, testable assemblies because it's got to be testable. Someone has to be able to go up to it and in a practical manner test and service it. So you can't put these things up too high unless you have a catwalk or a permanent assembly up there. That's why again and again and again, we see ASSC 1013s here shown to Kalefi 574 uh, that's gonna serve uh, overwhelming majority of the equipment we see. Because again, you, you can come out of there flowing horizontal and it can go vertical right away out of the out of the valve where you have that limitations now also you have to understand or verify if your valve is approved for vertical up or vertical down or even you know upside down whatever that orientation is that's all going to be in the proof the approval 
or listing by that independent agency because not all valves are approved for vertical up and vertical down. And then also shown here the air gap adapter and uh, that's important. So some products uh, it's going to be included more often than not uh, you're going to have to buy that and, and that can that can be 30 40 50 70 dollars to buy that part believe it or not lastly on this slide on the top you see the test cocks so that's where you're going to uh, a tester is going to put his gauges and his hose adapters and he's going to certify if you will annually that and i think we show that a little more in depth in an, another slide so we can go all right. Yeah, and I'll just talk quickly. So what happens with this RPZ is the flow comes in here, as I understand it, pops open this uh, check with about five pounds of pressure. It'll pop that open. This is a two pound pressure. So this is a normally closed NC uh, check here. Pressure opens it. This is an NO normally open. Once the pressure comes in, it goes down and it back seats this and shuts this port. So this being five and this being two, three pounds of pressure is always on this to keep it closed. So if we get, you know, something stuck like it, usually what happens with these is some Teflon tape or something gets stuck in the first check, the pressure course in this reduced pressure zone would increase to whatever's coming in here, then it would lift this off its seat and it would discharge that. And by the way, that can be a lot of water. If you get a rock or something comes through here, which is why you want to put a strainer on it, it could open this this port up enough that this opens that you get a good stream of water coming through. So um, again, and it, this is one of the valves that it's going to tell you when something's wrong with it. This kind of self-diagnoses itself. If it's dripping or streaming or spraying, it's telling you you got to take this apart. There's something either damaged in here or something stuck in here, and that's why it's I think kind of the granddaddy of the devices as far as the uh, as you can see on the hazard level up here, and also the one that's going to be tested once a year uh, by code requirement typically, and also um, uh, even if you test this one day and something damages that the next day, it's still going to fail and work. Like Jim said earlier, some of them you can test them and 15 minutes later that could fail and, you know, it still pass the test. Or this one, because of this reduced pressure zone and this low spring check here, it's going to let you know if something happened to that valve the day after the inspector uh, signed it off. Is that fair to say, Jim? Yes, absolutely. And some of that's shown uh, when we show the test kits adapted in some uh, training facilities. Yeah, I think that's coming up. But this, and, and I will throw one other thing, just a little cluffy spiel for you. We do include this with our uh, uh, other brands. You've got to buy this as a separate, can, we think we call it a ton dish or something in, in Europe is what this is called, but a little air gap there with, uh, you know, you can put your tube in it and just pinch it in there through the screws. But yeah, somewhere here coming up, I mean, we can zip through these, but you've now here's one that's not... Um, there's no tube going to the floor. And I don't think, Jim, there's a requirement that that has to have a tube to the floor, does it? No, it doesn't have a requirement that it is stubbed down, and therefore you don't need that adapter either. Yeah. What is what is nicely illustrated in this slide is uh, you see the green tagging uh, for the safe water, and then if you go to the upper right corner, you see the either unsafe or protected. And so what they're doing here, it continues past the backflow preventer, and then there's a pressure reducing valve for one use throughout a facility, and they are just lowering the pressure maybe for common plumbing fixture use. But the backflow preventer at this facility, I know, they're isolating a laboratory and they like the high pressure continuing to that laboratory. So also again, the identifying uh, triangle, which is pretty universal. And you see the test report, the annual test report hand, hand, uh, excuse me, hanging there. So if it's practical to keep it at the assembly, that's, that's best. But if you might be like in a foundry or car wash or something, that might be, you know, in the maintenance staff's office. So that's something, uh, in Wisconsin, and so just to illustrate what codes or, or water purveyors want, there's got to be a test report on site. The certified tester should have a test report with him because he's now going to get annual uh, requirement letters from the state or the water purveyor because his name is on that valve. And so now the report should be forwarded to the state and then also who's ever providing the water that... Uh, that's a four-part form, and it says right on it, uh, like the yellow copy will go to the department, which would be the state. Uh, that's kind of overseen by the Department of Natural Resources, and then the water purveyor, too. So it's important that the testers know who wants to get that copy. And, and it, it, you know, I think it's unreasonable to expect that uh, the tester 
says, well, go look for it or go to the site or go to the state site, it needs to be provided to who's selling the water because they have to keep uh, providing the water. They have to keep record of that. They keep record of the hazards as we can appreciate. They keep record of the performance tests that this thing is doing its job. Uh, let, let's go a little forward. I we think we can get to, again, shown here, uh, this is a 1013 again, quite a large system. They show a, a Y strainer on the left with the, the black piping. That's going to protect your valve. And uh, the identification here, again, is good. So you can tell uh, the orientation of flow by the, by the way the valve looks. You can kind of see it would be pushing check valves uh, up out of the way and the water flowing through when the water pressure is stronger than what's on the source side. And then they would close if the contaminant was flowing back and down the drain. And let's go forward again. I'd like to get to where we have the uh, testing. Another RP, this one shown for irrigation, a nice point there up out of the ground. Okay. And, and uh, installers would need to educate themselves on the height requirements. One foot up, 60 inches maximum. Like I said, you need some clearance from the walls for testing. You need clearance space out in front of it for servicing too. This one obviously is up and nice and accessible, but we all know you can get into mechanical rooms, you know, dark, wet, uh, used areas, old. And so then that's when some of that more comes into play. So let's go a little forward. This, this slide nicely little illustrates that uh, containment and isolation again. So they're containing the building. They are isolating uh, that fire protection then with that double check. So the, the building is contained on the supply side by the vertical double check. And so now that building is not going to let anything go back into the mains of the city. And then what they want to do by using the second double check is they're isolating that fire protection system from the water they're using. So they're keeping their water safe from that and they're protecting, you know, meeting a requirement to contain themselves from the, uh, from the city mains. And again, so the 1015 shown there, low hazard backflow preventer, likely going to fire protection with no chemicals, but needs backflow preventer because of the materials used in that fire protection system. Now, this is a vacuum breaker. Uh, there are ASSC certifications for 1020s and 1056s. You also need to know things like, is it approved for indoor use or outdoor use? Uh, and all the manufacturers, when you get into vacuum breakers and 1013 uh, reduced pressure principle assemblies, there's standards, it, it, uh, how many valves it has. Does it have an inlet and outlet valve? Does it have test ports? Now, this vacuum breaker has two test ports. As you saw on the RPs, the 1013s, four test cocks, we call them. So that's all used for the procedure when you're testing. Uh, vacuum breakers, you, you have to certify when the air inlet opens and when the check valve closes. So let's let's move on again. and. One, one knock on vacuum breakers is the height where you need to put them because, you again, no elevated piping. If you're using it on sprinkler systems, it's got to be higher than all the heads you might use uh, to distribute your water, your sprinkler heads. You, it, you may not have that in a basement because if it's going to go outside and serve, uh, you know, a flower area, grass area, it, it's just not going to work. So that's why typically you're going to see a lot more... 1013s and RPs that you are going to see vacuum breakers. And you can kind of follow this uh, schematic, if you will, this illustration, and you can see what they're doing here too. They're uh, containing and isolating both, both processes. And their irrigation, that vacuum breaker, that's a high hazard vacuum breaker. So Typically, when you have a high hazard vacuum breaker, that means there's chemicals uh, uh, injected somewhere, okay? And uh, that's, they do have atmospheric vacuum breakers too, ASSE 1001, but again, 
got to make sure it's installed at the right height, uh, whether it's continuous pressure, non-continuous, if you can have valves downstream, if you cannot, some of the atmospheric not, not testable uh, devices, you cannot have any valves downstream because again, it's not designed to be left in an open and flowing uh, orientation. Let's go on and uh, I would like to get to the one where we have the, the gauges on there. Fire protection here, low hazard, they have the bypass on there to detect uh, the smaller usage, usage leakage or unfortunately theft of water too. So that's why they have that one there. And again, you can view these slides. Okay, so here we have the gauges and what, what we're doing here, this is, this is a, a school and they're teaching testing. And so what they're doing by putting the hoses on, they're basically putting on uh, inlet and outlet sides of the check valves. And then checking, does that first check valve close above five PSI? The second check valve in an RP closes above, uh, the requirement is a minimum of one PSI. So that's all in the design. I'm sure the engineers uh, understand that standard a lot more as Bob nicely uh, explained uh, that the relief, there's a three PSI buffer between the relief and the first check. That one opens at two, so it vents. But what's, what's shown well here is the test kit on the valve, you've got water in the test kit, and then you, would, you emit air to the system and uh, you tell when that spring seats. Okay, and the check valve closes. So that that's what it, it it's fairly simple. It becomes a simple process for these testers, and uh, they they develop their own hybrid systems. Uh, the first thing they're going to do when they test is they come in and say, "We're turning off your water supply to this process." Okay. Oftentimes, what people do is they have a bypass with a backflow preventer of equal uh, hazard protection. So they can test one, leave the system operating, test another, and uh, then go through the other one and leave the system operating. Sometimes difficult to explain to a facility that it's in your best interest to design this a little better, a little more initial cost, but we're not gonna shut down your process because uh, you know some processes run 24 seven every day or they're running, you know, during the work week, so they cannot turn that off. So, and this slide here again showing uh, we have on the bottom with the gauge we have the ASSE 1013 that is the Kalepi 574. Above there's the 1015. Again, like I said, only for uh, non-chemically treated fire protection in Wisconsin. And then up above, they show the uh, ASSE 1020. And that 1020, that pressure vacuum breaker, ASSE's approval or recommendation at very least, that is only for outside. So uh, that one, they had an instance years ago where it flooded something. So that one is not approved any longer for, for inside uh, installation. If, if you uh, were gonna use something very similar, a vacuum breaker, it would be the 1056. Looks very similar, that one has indoor uh, appro approval. So, you know, important to familiarize with, again, the charts, the requirements, the designs, and kind of understand the process. And, and then again, the authority hit, the, the folks that are asking you for uh, what you need and how they interpret what needs to be protected. And you can reach out beforehand so you can kind of do your project once and do it ideally econ as economically as possible. Satisfy your customer and still, uh, you know, make the profit that you need. We can go forward there too. Bob, do you want to speak to this one a little bit? Yeah, so this is a, you know, the question becomes uh, with boilers, you know, which one do I need to put on a little residential boiler? And here's one of the issues. If you, somebody, the day you put it in or down the road, comes and squirts a chemical in there. Now this, I know this brand, I think this is a safe product here, um, you know, that would need a high hazard. But there's the question is, when does this happen or when could this happen? And that's why the requirement's getting a little uh, tougher on the having a higher hazard uh, protection device on boilers regardless of the pressure level even if it's under that 30 psi you're seeing more and more um, 
authorities have jurisdictions <laughs> saying, you know what, you, you got to go a step above what you've been doing. And so obviously that's going to take more cost. And the other side of that is then it's, it becomes something that has to be tested officially, right, Jim? If you put in a testable backflow preventer, somebody's got to do it and then Wisconsin record it. Um, yearly and if they don't you go you show up if they don't have it done right is that how it works if they correct and that typically it can be anywhere between uh, 100 and 500 dollars to get that tested and recorded there's recording fees with the state and uh, and so and testers can be certified they they do not have to be licensed plumber they just have to be able to uh, meet a few prerequisites to get into the training classes. Uh, ASSE has 40 hour classes for the training, but uh, the, the test reports are followed. And you know, you, typically uh, manufacturers can say, well, we, some of our equipment, uh, if it's aluminum or something, we're, we're not gonna put a bad chemical in there. And uh, you know, we can all say, we're gonna do everything we can to always make sure we know, uh, you know, what's being injected there. But as time goes by, uh, certain things, you know, maintenance staff can change, or even a building can be repurposed, or you know, so much can change. And when you have that induction site, if you will, that capability of adding those chemicals, that's why, it, uh, again, as you said, it illustrates that the, it, it's a high hazard concern. And I think that's uh, reasonable to say that that's the only way we feel we can protect against what can potentially happen. And and, and it's just the, the passage of time. I think everybody can understand that, that uh, you might have a process in a facility that the, the current maintenance staff and everybody understands, but as things turn, uh, or, you know, turn over, there might be something that slips through the cracks and we have to protect again against that worst case scenario. Yeah, you're protecting the public, basically. Is uh, shown here is some of the things that uh, this, I believe, is the uh, state of Wisconsin uh, registration, and uh, so they have a database that everyone can go on, and uh, they kind of can see where all these valves are and see what they serve, and and that's what's. Uh, that's how it's all tracked. That's the state regulated object number. So what the state says then is they tell the water purveyors, go and uh, make sure these tests are performed in the cycle that they need to be performed. Uh, I don't think it's real common for, for states to, to uh, regulate or track all regulated objects because there is an expense there. So I, I do think Wisconsin is in the minority of tracking all the regulated objects. They, when a, when a tester, uh, again, as I said, tests an assembly, he provides that report to them, selling them the water, providing the water, and he, uh, then he has to file with the state, and there's a fee for that, approximately a $25 fee to file his test report with the state. So offsets the, the state tracking it. Uh, it's, it's a pretty involved system there got a lot of checks and balances and uh, all you know authorities having jurisdiction all uh, enforce and interpret a different way they can they can explain that to everybody uh, as required but again we keep hammering home reach out and cooperate with each other let's see if we do have any more left again an RP everything's shown there the only uh, I didn't like about this slide that they had the green tagging on the outlet above the yellow there in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you definitely uh, want to stay away from putting green when you have something that's uh, protected or becomes non potable at that time. So the color coding is important. So as I understand it, the water, once the water comes into a building, it goes through this device, just the process of going through there, it turns it into non pot You don't want this water back under any condition if you're a provider. Right. A provider. It doesn't necessarily, if we have to call it an assembly, which means testable. It doesn't necessarily mean it's non potable, but it's protected for a reason. If it was a brewery, for example, they want you to know that this is protected water. Uh, let's say there could be beer in there. You don't want that coming out of a drinking fountain. You don't want that uh, commingling with a coffee maker or something. Doesn't necessarily mean uh, non-potable, but it is protected and it's protected for a reason. You have to go and look at where it ultimately goes. What's the end uh, point of use? That's why, as I said before, when I 
was trying to follow that pipe and it went to that helicopter thawing pad or you know it was uh, hydronic heating up there you, you got to kind of know where it goes and understand uh, you know what it all touches what the potential is that it could siphon or back but I mean and, once uh, this is in there Jim the city doesn't want this water back correct up. Yep, we got to supply it so it's it's just the potable safe water. And yep. even on coffee makers, espresso machines, uh, different things, we have to protect that from being in there because we can't have somebody open a tap and 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 get coffee out of it. You know, anything like that. Carbonated beverage. One thing I'd like to say uh, about orientation: carbonated beverage dispensers. It's very important where the backflow preventers are are placed. They have to be uh, placed, and it gets very specific between the pump and the carbonator. You can't just put it on a water supply shutoff or anything like that, because uh, there's there's different reasons that different products have to be used after the carbonators. You can't have any copper. You you have to have plastic or stainless steel piping. Processes can affect uh, piping materials and create some some real toxic substances. So that kind of again you have to understand where uh, your orientation of of your backflow preventers is. And uh, if we can move forward. One other, one other uh, device that we see a lot or piece of equipment is soap proportioners in commercial kitchens and things like that. And, and a lot of that equipment has air gaps built in it, so you may not need any backflow protection any at all. However, if you're adapting it onto a faucet or another plumbing fixture, there's a very specific way you have to connect that. If it has its own supply, it may be just fine. So an RP shown here. Let's advance through the last couple we might have and see if there's anything of any. We address this, yeah. some of the concerns that, and when it is in fact doing its job, okay. Gosh, you, you almost to the second here of wrapping through these slides. That's impressive. Thanks for, for doing that. Certainly on the first time, that, that was, uh, I, I'm amazed. So we did um, a YouTube video a couple of years ago on that little backflow preventer there. It's me, the talking head right there, talking about what I just explained a little bit earlier, how the checks work in that and how the vent works and uh, how they spit and why they spit and what you can do to uh, prevent them from having that one. Because, you know, we get backflow preventers sent back to us and we test them, they work fine. It's just the application they were putting was causing them to spit because of a, a pressure shock or a fast shut off solenoid valve or something like that. There's really nothing wrong with the valve. But, uh, we take them back and uh, uh, wishing everybody the best. Thanks again to my staff up in Milwaukee that uh, helps put this together and to Jim for taking the time to do all this. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bob. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>